Call to order the June 20th meeting of the Conestoga Valley Board of School Directors. The secretary please take attendance. Eight directors present. Mr. Dillman is absent. We have a, um, a quorum and also in attendance are the superintendent and the administrative cabinet. Will you please join me in the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd first like to announce that the board had an executive session on the 16th to discuss a personnel issue. I'd like to welcome those in attendance as well as those who join us online. This is the second meeting of the month where most official votes are taken, many of which are listed on a consent agenda, which includes those items which are routine or have been discussed at our work session last week. Details of all items related to public documents as well as minutes of past meetings are available on the district website. Requirements of school code, legislative directives, the original Sunshine Act, all subsequent amendments, judicial rulings, and our district policy to the best of our understanding are, are followed to the best of our understanding and ability. Details of all items related to public documents as well as minutes are available on the district website and the posted agenda. I will now uh, accept a uh, motion to approve the agenda. So, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Board commendations. As usual, I've lost it. This is an opportunity for us to recognize our students and staff for special achievements. Congratulations to the following CVHS Boys Lacrosse players for earning Lancaster Lebanon Awards. First team, Jeff Fisher and Keller Dillman. Second team, Tyson Zwafka, Hunter Savaggio, Noah Harrison, Miles Jackson, Justin Corson, Jackson Byers, Bryce Johnson, and Bren Noll. Academic All-Star, Keller Dillman. Class Act Award, Michael Burnett. Congratulations to CVHS Student Council for their support of the Penn State Thon through CV's version of Minithon. Their efforts yielded $5,669 and is donated to the Four Diamonds to assist families with children being treated for cancer at Penn State Children's Hospital. Congratulations to members of the Husky Middle School Gifted Program who earned the top three spots in Pennsylvania during the National Stock Market Game held at Elizabethtown College. First place team B. Hollister, Isaiah Richardson, Micah Souter, and Arian Shaw. Second place team, Ben Cole, Kit McPhee, and Taylor Smith. Third place team, Sean Becker, Sean Becker Bueller, and Madison Gonzalez. Congratulations to the member of the CBHS Boys Volleyball team as they earn Lancaster Lebanon League All Star Star Recognition. First team, Camden Clapper. Second team, Carson Hoover, Ken Jaffa, and Kyle Hutchinson. Congratulations to Matthew Oberly as he was named the 2022 Lancaster Lebanon Intermediate, Intermediate 13 Annie Sullivan Award recipient. Named after Helen Keller's lifelong companion, this prestigious award is presented to a professional who portrays exemplary care to students with disabilities by going beyond the classroom to help those in the community at large. Matthew has been a special education teacher with the IU 13 since 2017 and located at CB High School in that role since the 2018-20 school year. Congratulations to elementary, Smoketown Elementary 5th grader Angelina Lee as she was named a winner in a Lancaster Newspaper Student Journalism Contest. This year's theme, Claiming Our Future, included an advertising portion and Burden Handbank selected Angela's ad as its winning submission for conveying its mission. Congratulations to the following CVHS softball players for earning Lancaster Lebanon League All-Star recognition. First team, Lincoln Smith, Becca Hartreff, Brianna Henry, an honorable mention to Cassie Horning. And am I missing something for our esports team? Are you missing what now? An announcement for the esports team. I had did not receive anything for esports yet. Oh, okay. I had that newspaper article. I will get that in for July. Oh, okay. Don't want to skip the esports team. Okay. Superintendent's comments. Thank you, Madam President. We have one change to the agenda, and the superintendent's report is noted in red. 
That's different than what was posted on Friday. We've added Gretchen Reisner, social studies teacher at the middle school, to the list of resignations as we just received her letter today. Now, on the flip side, we continue to find exceptional candidates in our hiring process as we fulfill staffing needs to start the 22-23 school year. I'm going to turn the first one over to uh, Mr. Appleby, who's going to introduce one of his newest tech members, uh, Lucas. So go ahead, Josh. Thank you, Dr. Z. Good evening, board. So I'd like to introduce to you Lucas Causal, uh, who's going to be joining us in Desktop Support Specialist here in the district. So, Lucas. Yes, I'm, I'm Lucas. Uh, I'm excited for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to work with you and, and have a great experience over here. That's awesome. Welcome, Lucas. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Lucas. Welcome. At the elementary level, uh, we're proud to introduce Taylor Alwis. Taylor came to us as the assistant principal for Fritz and Smoketown Elementaries, and since February, she has served the district as interim principal for Smoketown. Prior to her work at CV, Taylor amassed 13 years of teaching experience at the primary level in both Maryland and Pennsylvania. She earned her bachelor's degree in elementary education from Lock Haven University. I went there when it was Lock Haven State College. <laughs> <laughs> Don't remind me. I remember when it was in Lock Haven when State Teachers College. College. Hey, this is not your moment. Okay. Her master's degree in curriculum instruction from Bloomsburg University and is currently finishing up work on her doctorate in educational leadership from Wilkes University. This avid Star Wars fan cites being a mom as her greatest accomplishment. On behalf of the students, parents, faculty, and staff of Leola Elementary, we are proud to recommend to her recommend her as the new principal at Leola Elementary School. So, congratulations. Thank you. Any words of wisdom? No, but thank you. <laughs> um, joining Taylor at Leola is Caitlin Hogan. Caitlin was approved a couple weeks ago, and she's an Elizabethtown College graduate, earning her bachelor's degrees in elementary education and special education. While at E-Town, she was also able to spend a semester abroad at the Florence University of Arts in Florence, Italy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Caitlin is currently working on her master's degree in special education at Millersville. In addition, she brings with her from Columbia Borough School District five years of special education teaching experience and two years of general education teaching experience, both at the elementary level. We are excited to see the impact she will have at our K-2 emotional support classroom at Leola. Welcome, Caitlin. Thank you so much. I'm really excited. We're excited to have you. <laughs> We continue to get high quality candidates to continue CV's tradition of excellence. On a side note, middle school families should be on the lookout tomorrow for Dr. Metzinger's initial Huskins Highlights newsletter. Where is it? Rachel, is that correct the way I said that? Yep. Okay. <laughs> She'll be introducing her communication plan for the summer, assistant principal introductions, a reading challenge, and also introducing her facility dog, Coco, just to name a few items. So, again, middle school families, be on the lookout tomorrow for that newsletter. That's all for tonight, Madam President. Are there any comments from CBA? I'm sorry, I skipped the next one. I skipped a couple, didn't you I? You did. That's okay. That's all right. You're out of that. You were the first one. Do we have any correspondence? No. See, there was nothing to be done. There board comments. Yes, I met with the foundation on Friday. Um, it was the first thing I finally got to go to. Did you and do that for us at the board? At the board oh, you prefer I wait? Yeah. Would you mind? That's what you want. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <I'll> stop talking. <laughs> it works. Public comments. Are there any public comments related to the agenda? Any comments from CBEA? Any comments from any other employee groups? Then we will move on to the consent agenda. Are there any concerns about the consent agenda? A through double H. <laughs> If not, we'll uh, entertain a motion to approve that. And we, we, we approve the agenda as agenda is presented. Second. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Benigno? Aye. Mr. Talley? Aye. Mrs. Kapka? Aye. Mr. Gensel? Aye. Mr. Hurst? Aye. Dr. Martin? Aye. Ms. Trowbridge? Aye. Mrs. Groff? Aye. In the action discussion agenda this evening, we'll start with uh, Mrs. Heverly Flesher and the budget uh, motions. And that means you're official, by the way. Just you know. okay. if you so you always want to tell them <laughs> I am. <laughs> you know, always do that. So, but it's now they can cool. leave, right? Uh, they can finish you going. 
<laughs> so it's a very short PowerPoint attached to your board agenda tonight. Um, the only slide that I changed in it was the one that had the fund balances on. Uh, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in the agenda, but you also have on action tonight the fund balance resolution, which we typically do twice a year. So we will come to you with that uh, around the time that we do the audit. So usually the auditor comes in November and presents the year-end numbers. I'll kind of give you a highlight in October of where we're probably going to come in at, but we officially do that in November. And then sometimes we have to adjust some of those assigned and committed fund balances then. And this is the second time of year that then we do that in preparation for the approval of the final budget. The only difference on that slide was, as I had mentioned last week, we're projecting to have a little bit of a surplus this year. So we projected to move that um, into capital reserve. Uh, so then we'll have it for projects and other capital items going forward, can pull it back when we need to for those purposes. And so that 8% fund balance number that was about $8.7 million now moved down to about 7.2 on that slide. So that's the only change. Uh, the five-year projections that you have attached are the same. The PDE 2028 form, which is the official budget form uh, that the state has us use, uh, has the same numbers in it that it had last week. So unless you have further questions, we can just move through the, uh, the approvals. Take a motion to approve the, the uh, final budget. I move we approve final budget. Second. Do we have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Talley? Aye. Mrs. Kavka? Aye. Mr. Gensel? Aye. Mr. Hurst? Aye. Dr. Martin? Aye. Ms. Trowbridge? Aye. Mr. Benigno? Aye. Mrs. Groff? Aye. Okay, so the next item on the agenda then, uh, once we do the budget, then we actually have to put all the tax levies in place. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a separate resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, back a number of years ago when we went into this uh, Act 1 format in 2006, so the solicitor recommended, gives us these recommended documents to use. Uh, so if you looked at this document in years past, it looks very similar, except for the numbers obviously change. Uh, so um, you can see the new millage rate uh, reflected here. Uh, so we would need a, uh, a motion a second and then approval to adopt this so that we can get the tax bills out. I move we approve the resolution as presented. Second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Mrs. Kafka? Aye. Mr. Gensel? Aye. Mr. Hurst? Aye. Dr. Martin? Aye. Ms. Trowbridge? Aye. Mr. Benigno? Aye. Mr. Aye. Talley? Mrs. Groff? Aye. You're on a roll. I am. Mm -hmm. So the next one, as I had mentioned, is um, it ref the as assignment um, and commitment of fund balance, uh, which reflects the numbers that I had mentioned were on the slide in the PowerPoint. <laughs> we'll sit here all night, folks. Yeah. Hey, uh, go scroll. scroll Do you have a question? Scroll no, to no, the no. Top? Just, scroll. Scroll the other just so I can see the title. Oh. I uh, move we approve the resolution for commitment <laughs> and assignment of the June 30th, 2022 fund balance. Second. No, I, I respect <laughs> that. Just, That's how it should be done. That's what it should be done, yeah. Yes. It just makes it easier. Thank we you, have Mr. Talley. Right. <laughs> now, who had brave enough to second that? I did. Second. Okay, second. We have a roll call vote, please. Mr. Gensel? Aye. Mr. Hurst? Aye. Dr. Martin? Aye. Ms. Trowbridge? Aye. Mr. Benigno? Aye. Mr. Talley? Aye. Mrs. Kavka? Aye. Mrs. Croft. All right. You can see how glad we are and pleasant this is to have it over. Yeah. <laughs> Next. One last one, uh, the suspension of the per capita tax. So back in um, for the 2016-17 year, uh, we actually increased the real estate tax enough to cover the per capita tax this year, that year, suspended the per capita, which um, we, we had prior received a lot of complaints about. It's a small tax. It's a nuisance tax. And frankly, what it cost us to collect it <laughs> probably wasn't worth what we actually got out of it. Uh, so um, when we did that, uh, the recommendation from the solicitor was just to suspend it each year so that in case you would ever decide that you wanted to levy it again, it's a little easier uh, to put the levy back in place than to actually reinstitute the tax back into place. Uh, so we take this action each year to suspend the per capita tax for the upcoming year. I, I would add that at the time, a lot of schools did simply eliminate it. Sure. Some schools kept it, and that option is always up to us at some time in the future. Yes. That much said, could I have a motion? 
I move we approve the resolution for spending the per capita tax. Second. <laughs> Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hurst. Aye. Dr. Martin. Aye. Ms. Trowbridge. Aye. Mr. Bedingo. Aye. Mr. Tower. Aye. Mrs. Kafka. Aye. Mr. Genzo. Aye. Mrs. Groff. Aye. Thank now you. I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Johnson, you have two uh, for us to approve this evening. I do. Yes, good evening, everyone. In preparation of the move from the existing middle school to the new building, I met with three moving companies. I sent out proposals to four. Um, I received two. Uh, I, you, you try. I, just, I don't know. Well, you try. I mean, yeah, it, four, it's, you get credit for four, yeah. even though two only came back. It, it, it just is very difficult sometimes to get responses back from, from companies and proposals back. And uh, But the two that, that I did meet with, Armstrong was one. Uh, I had checked on their references of both. Um, Armstrong uh, was utilized recently by Penn Manor with a lot of their moves around with their high school project. Uh, Wayne Moving Company I also was another one that came referred to me from uh, other facilities managers in the area and also uh, from Westchester area school district and that's a district that has done a lot of moves over the years and they've, they've utilized Wayne pretty much exclusively. So in speaking to um, everyone it, it made sense to look at this as a time and material type option because mm -hmm. Yeah, they can come in, they can look at what we have, but until you actually do the work, you know, especially with us moving a lot of the wood metal shop equipment over, that's not mm -hmm. exactly the things you can put in a box. Mm -hmm. So we have two pianos. We don't have much furniture moving over, but there's a lot of things <coughs> like science labs, the beakers, the mi microscopes, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, they are responsible to pack up and move a lot of that themselves. Uh, we have 13,500 books that have to be moved from one point to another. You so, counted all the books? That's amazing. No, I, no, I, I asked the librarian how many she had in collections. <laughs> <laughs> Work smarter, not harder. <laughs> so, uh, I assume they do it by pounds. Uh, actually, yeah, it's, it's they put it on carts and they roll the carts. So <laughs> it's pretty simple for them to do it. Uh, so we got two prices in. Um, the one being, you know, forty-eight thousand five fifty as a a best guess scenario based on previous type of similar moves. Uh, Armstrong came in at fifty thousand and eighty, but that didn't not include the actual rental of the library carts. So that was going to be additional monies on top of that. So uh, the other concern I had was Wayne Moving said that they're figuring probably about five days where the Armstrong was figuring three weeks. So I think it's how they were manning it. And I'm not convinced that Armstrong has the manpower to do the job. Where Wayne moving obviously does. He's like, yeah, I'll put seven guys here, seven guys there. We'll have two trucks running. So it's, yeah. I could just tell, you know, a comfort level just on how he was looking at things and how he was foreseeing how to make the move. So my recommendation is to go with Wayne moving. And since they were both estimates, we're not stuck with having to go with the one that's a little bit lower. Correct. Okay. You would like that approved? I would love that approved, yes. Is that a motion? Go ahead. Make a motion to uh, approve the Wayne moving. Second. Second. You have a roll call, please. Dr. Martin? Aye. Ms. Trebridge? Aye. Mr. Benigno? Aye. Mr. Tao? Aye. Mrs. Kafka? Aye. Mr. Gensel? Aye. Mr. Hurst Aye. and Mrs. Brock. Aye. It's really nice for everybody gets to go first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your next one. All right. Uh, one of my capital projects for this summer was the IFAS resurfacing or drive it um, stucco to what most people see. And this would be for the entire, if you look at the main entrance of the high school, the entire left and right of the main entrance, and then there's an area wall that's up you don't really see it. It's on the, the east side of the rail gym that's above the roof line that also has the same surface material on it. And <laughs> in looking to maintain that material so we so it doesn't disintegrate or deteriorate because it's basically a stucco finish over basically insul insul insulation board. And if that starts to fail then you get moisture in there and then it kind of works like a sponge. It never dries out. So uh, we've had issues at Lee all over the years that were corrected. Um, 
the woodpeckers seem to like it. Um, and then they make a hole and then the starlings move in. So it's, you know, kind of a community-based um, <laughs> thing there going on. Um, also, the, the back wall of the auditorium at Leola for a lot of years was uh, a good target for softballs, lacrosse balls, yeah. those kind of things. So they make nice divots. Um, that's been repaired. We haven't had any issues since. Uh, so this is basically a resurfacing and a recoding. And the plan is, is that next year I'll come back and we'll we'll work our way around the classroom wings and then inside the courtyard as well, just to get it updated and maintained. So similar to doing a roof, it's just vertical on a wall. Is there a sealant that can go on that so it doesn't have to be redone? Basically, this is works as a sealant for it. Oh. Uh, the product has... Definitely improved over the years. Okay. The the fibers they put in into it and the chemical makeup it is much different than what it was originally. It'll last longer than it does reason. last much oh, longer okay. now. Yes. More much more durable and it's much more impact resistant than it was originally. Okay. Yeah. What is the expected time frame before you have to touch it again? Uh depends upon weathering and damage, but uh some of that was done. Let's see going back and picking my brain here a little bit on dates uh that was done when they did the when they did the window infill so that would have been 80s early 90s time frame yeah so that really hasn't been touched since now we did some work at the real gym that was done in oh oh four oh five uh but that's some things need there it has taken more weathering um, there at the real gym, but uh, the what's on the front of the building that was probably early 90s, okay. yeah, time frame. They had gone through and done a uh, that would have been strip windows from one end of the building to the other and energy crunch and everything. So they tore all those out and just popped just smaller windows into the to the building and then used that insulation as a extra insulation for the building, okay. So, I noticed also that it came in above budget because of materials yes. and um, fuel costs. And you gave two other uh, possible alternatives. I did. One was do less of it this time. The other is not to do it this summer. Uh, what would you prefer? I would prefer to move forward because I'm, I'm afraid that if we don't do any of it or we do less of it, it's just going to cost that much more next year or the year after we're going to be chasing our tail. And the damage will increase. Yeah. And the, the issue we've been seeing with, with any material, any, any bids, any project costs right now is they're just going astronomically higher than, than what we're estimated. So back in November, when we put these numbers together, we didn't have the fuel costs we were having today. So I talked to one vendor, they're, they're surcharging 49% on fuel. Oh, yeah. The other option we would have is remember, as I said, we're going to move some money to capital. If we have to bring some back to make this work, we can oh. do that as well. Okay. We have a motion. Well, I was going to say, sorry. and your feeling between Paramount and Elite? Uh, Paramount's fine. Used them in the past. No issues. Local company. Um, yeah. Any other questions? If you scroll up back down, maybe. I you want to approve the bid? <laughs> <laughs> approve the bid for. Do you want to make a motion? She does. Go the first one. Oh everyone, has, everyone, has, everyone has to, everyone has to do one. She's taking yeah, it. Let's start somewhere. The part is approve the bid for. Okay. I approve the bid for the um, Conestoga Valley High School EIFS restoration. Second. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Trowbridge. Aye. Mr. Benigno. Aye. Mr. Talley. Aye. Mrs. Gen uh, Mrs. Mrs. Kapka. <laughs> That's a new development. Excuse me. Mrs. Kapka. Aye. Mr. Genske. Aye. Mr. Hurst. Aye. Dr. Martin. Aye. Mrs. Croft. Aye. Thank you Ron, very much. Thanks, Sam. It all goes downtown this summer. Mm -hmm. We didn't even get invited. Did we skip the uh, cameras? Neither did my wife. <laughs> no thought is coming out for the. Oh, okay. She's right. I thought she was asking, and we skipped the camera. <laughs> so. Good evening, board. Uh, so what I have before you is just an RFP for review under the middle school construction project to be funded under FF&E for campus, sorry, 
higher education mindset, the the building's IP security camera system. So um, we're selected a product called Rhombus. It's a cloud-based camera utility, uh, very similar to one you might have heard Verkata. It's very similar to that. There's no central server that we have to maintain, high costs and considerable investment value. Um, the cameras themselves have the smart brains to them and they connect to the network and give lots of the flexibility and a lot of the software that's with them as well. Uh, Rhombus was chosen upon a selection process we did about a year ago. We looked at a couple different products and this was the, the one that kind of really settled nice. Um, helps that it's also on Peplum pricing so it makes my job easier. Um, but talking with some other districts, Manheim Townships, New Middle School, they went with the same camera system. Um, Can you explain and Peplum pricing please? For Peplum is the number. state procurement um, I don't know exactly what it stands for. Pe Pennsylvania. It's a, it's, a cooperative it's a cooperative purchasing for the state, for all state institutions. So, um, Is that the one that usually has the prices in advance? You don't even have to take the bid? Yes, it's and a lot of companies will be specific to bid the contract, but the contracts are piggybackable by other company or vendors yeah. to sell as well. Um, so that means it's all been pre-bid and pre-cost assessed and agreed upon, so it qualifies, uh, which is really great. So... Um, so the total on the submission, so the, the way the project works is the equipment is going to be under the PEPM contract, and then the actual labor costs, which does count for prevailing wage under the RFP, I made it spelled out specifically, they're doing under the COSTAR 40, which is another one of the state competitive bids, but it um, largely helps with labor and a lot of that kind of cost assessment. So we're doing it under two different state contracts. Um, and KIT is the company that Mannheim Township went with, so they were highly recommended. And then when you talk with the manufacturer, that's who they recommend to to do a lot of the installation because they'll support us. Cameras come with a 10-year warranty, which I'm going to tell you in my business hasn't existed until now with this kind of technology, which is great. If the camera dies, they mm -hmm. will literally ship us out a replacement. We swap it out and put it back up. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and additionally, because we went with a cloud-based camera solution, the variety of the camera that was available to us allowed us to cut about 20 <coughs> different camera points out. Um, so if you look at executive content, you'll see where the diagram had it originally planned with camera points and angles. A lot of the places you'll see two cameras. We were opted, able to opt for one camera that hit 360 angles, but it's digital and there's some video wall capabilities. So from my perspective, it's it's an added benefit with one less thing to have to maintain. Well, plus, we have a larger area covered and yes. no one can go around and try to figure out where what's covered. Yes. Well, and with the new middle school design, you have a lot more of those external egresses. So we had a lot more areas to cover for, for cameras, unlike some of the, the current design buildings. So there's a lot of that flexibility. It was really helpful. So any questions? I have a motion, please. A motion to approve the Rhombus Canvas. Rhombus Canvas is <laughs> <in> middle school. <laughs> Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Benigno. Aye. Mr. Tapp. Aye. Mrs. Kapka. Aye. Mr. Gensel. Aye. Mr. Hurst. Aye. Dr. Martin. Aye. Ms. Trowbridge. Aye. And Mrs. Qual. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And here is what we've all been waiting for. This is it. I'm going to turn this over to whomever is going to be presenting with you. Oh, everybody is Everybody's in coming. Everyone has a party. Yes. That's only appropriate. So here's Dr. Z. This is it. And um, the comprehensive plan, <clears throat> again, was uh, probably a good nine months in the making. And it's a solid plan that we have actually put in place. We, we had a three-year plan to implement the plan and the board's goals match those those three years of the plan so um, starting out is is mine the profile of the CV learner and the deliverable that we wanted on that plan was to develop rubrics that measure each of the I statements underneath the five competencies I brought together a teachers K to 12 and we worked on developing rubrics and I thought for sure that we were going to have an elementary rubric and a secondary rubric. I had the K2 teachers working together, the 3-5, the 6-8, and the 9-12 in four different groups. Once they developed the, their rubric, I had the K2 work with the middle school and the 3-5 work with the high school and then they came up with the rubric and then everybody got together to create a rubric and I still thought it was going to be an elementary and a secondary. They, they exceeded any expectations that I had, 
and created a K-12 rubric. It's a, it's a three-step rubric, and the ultimate proficiency is actually the I statement. So that I statement can be met at every level from K through 12. So just because you're in kindergarten doesn't mean you can't hit the far right side of the rubric. This is not a work your way up to being a senior. It is what is the competency expected as a kindergarten student. And being a good communicator might be, okay, take your turn. You have to listen first, and then you talk. And that might be one of the I statements. But it's not written that simply. It's interpreted that simply by the kindergarten teachers. So we gave ourselves a check mark there. We've got the rubrics. Um, we will meet with the, that same uh, educational leadership team in September. And then now we will plan the rollout of our expectations of the teachers throughout the school year. We'll start out slow. We'll say for the first marking period, we need you to do two rubrics for two of the I statements, or whatever the number is, because it'll be a collaborative effort with the teachers. But again, moving forward on the profile of a learner. Any questions on that first step? All right, here's an example of the rubric. Again, so we did learning, growing, and succeeding. So if you're succeeding, you've hit in the I statements. And again, it does not matter K through 12. Obviously, um, a, kindergarten teacher, a kindergarten student can't read these, <laughs> but we have kindergarten teachers that can interpret them for the kindergarten students. Correct. <clears throat> All right, uh, Don. Yeah, the, the second um, priority area is on the district's instructional model. Um, as you may recall, the, we had been working on this instructional model began in the winter of 2020. And um, we just ruled the thing out, and, and we're starting our professional development plan on following up with that, and then COVID hit. <clears throat> so it kind of been, been dormant since then. And so as part of the comprehensive plan, we felt that we needed to revisit that. Uh, it was a lot of good work that was put in the, into uh, that model. And so in revisiting that, we thought, year one, we need just to do an audit. Because we had ruled it out, but we didn't do any follow-up work with it. Um, and as, if you look at the instructional model, the, the, the three key areas, the positive school climate, the uh, flexible learning environment, and the relevant and rigorous learning experiences um, are, are the key driving areas, and the first thing we thought we needed to do was, what's going on in our classrooms that in these areas, and, and to do an audit? And so the, the team looked at a couple different things. One of the things that we did was we did these uh, monthly updates to the staff, and so we created a um, PowerPoint that was shared with the principals with talking points that they revisited the instructional model with their staff. And as part of that, there were talks. They um, would stop and discuss certain areas and so forth. And then following that, we gave them a, a, um, a survey where they were to go through the different areas and rank their priorities. Because there's a lot, of, a lot in the model, and there's obviously too much to do at once. And our plan for the model initially was a three-year process. Um, so we, we asked the staff to prioritize uh, through their lens, regardless of what level they are, through their lens, um, what, what we need to focus on. So we got that information. The other thing that the, the committee did was we worked on doing instructional walks through the classrooms. So beginning in March through April, <coughs> actually it's probably started in April, <laughs> um, we did uh, classroom visits. And so administrators partnered up. So I went with for example, Dr. Janiker threw a couple. I went with Dr. Smith for some. Um, Mrs. Trasborg, I was at Fritz. And same with um, Jill with pairing up. We actually went through 180 classrooms <coughs> in that short period of time. And so we, during that, we created a, a, um, a document where we were recording things that we observed. And following each walkthrough, the, the two administrators would reflect <coughs> on, all right, what did we see? Kind of calibrating themselves and then taking a little bit of notes. So now we're at the process of, all right, we've got priorities by the staff, and we have the information from the walkthroughs. We're going to work this summer on looking at that and comparing <coughs> that and then helping to decide what are our next steps as we get into year two of implementation of the instructional model and follow up to that. Any questions about that? There's a nice logo of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And, and Dr. Lee, before you do move. So uh, obviously, you can see the, the profile of CV learners in the middle there. Um, the instructional model actually followed the development of the profile of CV learner. And, and as you can see, the intent was to support the profile, that all the work that we do is through that lens. So the instructional model itself is through the lens of the profile of a CV learner. So we keep coming back to the North Star or the purpose. I just wanted to point that out. It's still nice little bell. <laughs> okay, so our next focus area in the plan was around the multi-tiered system of supports, MTSS. How many times have I said those four letters now to the board? I think every time I come to the table, this is what we talk about. And our year one deliverable was to take a look at what we already have in place at the district. If you recall, this is our three tiers. Tier one is the core instruction that's happening, all kids, all levels, every classroom. Tier two then goes to those targeted supports for specific students. And then tier three, we move into really intensive supports for just a few students who, who would need that. Um, so this year, our action team spent time developing what we called tiered resource <coughs> maps, where our reading specialists, our math specialists, our school teams work together to almost do an inventory of what do we have in place for each of those tiers. We looked at ELA, we looked at math, and then we looked at the social, emotional learning and behavior. Um, from that, we worked with patent. Some of our patent consultants came down. They visited our, our elementary classrooms, did what's called an environmental scan to look for evidence of some of those um, supports in place in our school buildings. And that really helped us establish that baseline for where we want to go next. And so we took that information, put it together, with those classroom visits that Dr. Mann just talked to you about. So what happened was our action teams actually ended up merging data and collaborating on some of those pieces to work on um, the pieces that we wanna focus on for next school year. So one of those being around those that positive learning environment, looking at um, PBIS, positive behavior intervention and supports. This is where the ELA, the math pieces, looking at the curriculum that we have in place, the resources we have in place, that comes out of this action team saying, hey, we really need to strengthen that core, that tier one. Um, so those were, were some of the big action steps that we took this year that are going to frame us and, and put us in a good position to keep this work moving in year two. The next one, um, individualized professional development learning for our staff. Um, so another little side note, priority two is one of those priorities in the comprehensive plan that's multifaceted. I mean, there's a lot of, of um, key things listed in there, MTS being one, the instructional model, um, this being another one. Um, what we started doing this year was taking a look at our differentiated plan, our, uh, which we have for our staff. In addition to that, Act 13 came on board from the state in the different ways that we look at how we evaluate staff and, and how that how the districts are to respond to that. As a result of that, trying to bring those two things together. So the committee met several times throughout the year. We um, consulted with um, uh, Jen Reinhardt, Reinhard, um, who helped guide the, the committee work. And so where we ended up with at the end of the year was we started unpacking the differentiated supervision plan. We now are looking at the Act 13 information that we have from this first year of implementation of that. Now we're working on bringing those things together. The key piece to all of this, at least for me, is the fact that we want to make a professional development plan that's individualized. You know, we talk about creating programs, individual programs for learners, student learners. We need to treat our professional staff the same way. Now granted, there are times where everyone has to sit and get <laughs> the same thing. You know, they, uh, some of them, for example, comes out from the state. But then once you get past that, um, letting the professional staff work with their supervisor in developing a plan that makes most sense for them. An example would be like technology, the integration of technology. So we're working at the high school next year with the implementation of the iPads. There's a, a number of staff members that are, have been working on the uh, Apple certification on their own or through their summer work. So when we get into that next year, to make them sit through the exact same stuff that others and, or do you let them take a next, the next level? So that's, that's an example of like trying to personalize the learning 
so that we're getting the information to the staff at the, at the time they need it and supporting them as they continue on. So more to come on this um, in, in year two. Okay, so then we moved into our third priority area. And that priority area, the big overarching theme is growth and achievement. And our first deliverable in this area was to really look at our um, growth and achievement data and figure out where we were post-COVID. We had a little bit of a work stoppage. You can see our, our yellow here. Um, because our action team had identified our PVAS data. So that is the Pennsylvania Value Added Assessment System. And typically that data comes back to us in October. And that's our growth data. That shows us a student coming in in fifth grade. It doesn't matter if they're advanced. It doesn't matter if they're below basic, wherever they come in, that system measures, <coughs> did they move a year? Did they actually gain a year's worth of, lear of learning while they were with us, okay? So green is a year. We made it start to finish. The PVAS data this year didn't drop until the spring. If you remember, they, some of the districts actually could do their PSSA testing in the fall, so that moved all of the data released back. So our team kind of had a little timeout um, waiting for that data to come in. But when it did come in, we're very excited to share some of the analysis that our group looked at. We met with our statewide PVAS team. We walked through some of the reports. We felt like these particular um, data points really capture the successes from Conestoga Valley over the 2021 school year. So what you're looking at right here is from the 2021 PSSA. So that would have been a year after the closure, all right? So Conestoga Valley was in person that whole year. Um, the, the decisions the board made, the support from the administrators, the families, students. Here's what we saw as a result of this. And now, again, this is growth data. So this is looking at how much did that student grow? How much uh, did they attain? This isn't proficiency level. It's, it's did they make that one year, okay? You can see from this data that our math grades five to eight, first of all, Conestoga Valley's growth overall for math was the highest growth in Lancaster County of all the school districts in Lancaster County. Our, our blue dots are so far past the green um, that really what that says is in compared to the rest of students in this state, CV was off the charts in how much their students grew academically during that school year in math. Same thing for ELA. You're looking for that light blue. Dark blue is just well exceeded that one year. And you can see, you're, we're almost even into the, they call it the stretch band. You see how they have that little extra piece at the end? They have to actually stretch it further <laughs> to capture uh, where some of the districts are. So ELA, we were the third highest district in Lancaster County that year. Science grade eight, again, the highest growth in Lancaster County. This really speaks to the decisions that the board made, the decisions that the administrators made, the protocols that were put in place, the, the parent support, student support, family support, and following that health and safety plan, uh, you could just see the tremendous outcomes for students academically. The next slide then shows you the high school. So this is these are our keystone growth measures for 2021, so that, that one year after the pandemic, and again, well above in algebra, well above in literature, second highest in Lancaster County for literature. And then we exceeded the growth um, standard in biology as well. When we tell you, we, we, Don and I were at a training and we were talking with some members of the statewide PVAS team. And um, when they pulled up our data and were looking at it, I mean, their eyes were big with, wow, this is, this is absolutely fantastic growth data. So our action team is now um, going to put this together with, we did get some preliminary PSSA results for this year, 2022. So again, we'll be looking at another year later. What's the impact now on achievement? Okay, again, this is growth. Did we make a year we went above a year for the majority of our students. Uh, but now we want to look at how does that translate 
to students meeting the grade level standards? Are they achieving proficiency? And so that, um, that piece is where we're going to line up the two um, with the new data that was recently released. I have a quick question. When you say we're comparing the students, is it comparing them, our students previously, or are we looking at all the schools in, in the state as to how, where our growth just this past year? So these, okay. it's, you know, it's a great question. It's a great question I because like, I need to know what's comparing. it depends on what report you're looking at. So this report right here lines up CV students with all the students in the state of Pennsylvania. So when you're looking at these numbers, it's, it's CV compared to the other 499 districts, all the fifth graders across the state. For our action team, we want to do exactly what you just said. We want to start now drilling down to the student level to look at how did our students actually achieve? Are there groups of students, is there sixth grade ELA? I'm just throwing that out as a, you know, where were those pockets that we need to strengthen the supports for and we need to find other ways to accelerate learning? So that would be internally looking at our students um, as far as their proficiency goes. Yeah, that's my concern. Like, I don't care how we compare to all the other bottom of the barrel fish in the state. I need to know how our kids are progressing from the year before, the year before, the year before. Yeah. Yep, so that's that will be the work. And we like to, like I said, we like to, because you're exactly right, you can have this growth data, but there may be pockets of proficiency meeting that grade level standard that don't quite line up. And that, that's exactly what we want to find um, now that we have the new PSSA data in. Yeah, and one thing to just, just be mindful of, the state has a tendency of changing the metric like two or three years after the metric starts. So you don't have a lot of historical right. data to figure out if you're doing well or not. You're right. Because the baseline always resets. But my whole, like yeah. we're comparing all the kids who went through COVID. Yeah. So all the kids are behind. So yes, our kids are above all the behind kids, but yeah. how far behind are all the kids in the first place? Yeah. That's, so that's my concern. Great question. So to clarify another piece here too, we did find out from the statewide PVAS team that we actually are going to be getting a district-specific report that shows what they call the effect size, that shows the impact on CV students, specifically CV compared to CV. What are the, like PVAS is running all of that statistical data for us just for our district. Now again, they're running it on 2021 data, so we're we're a year behind now on that data, yeah. um, but at least it will give us something to say, statistically, here was the, the net impact of um, the pandemic on the district and on different grade levels and different subject areas. So uh, we are looking forward to that. They, let it, they thought those reports would be coming in um, by the end of June. Any more questions on, on the PVAS? <clears throat> um, equity audit, uh, again, this is another work in progress. Uh, we had conversations with uh, the reps from Catan and also from PSBA. In fact, we had mentioned last week that we had the person from PSBA come in to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And as you remember, Taylor talked about that during her, her interview. So that was our first step in going into this. Um, our, our next step, we'll have free future conversations with the board to see if we can run that same training with the board to talk about the belonging because we want to make sure that we have an understanding of what diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging really is and how it looks in CV. So before we jump into an equity audit, we want to make sure that, that we take a look at our understanding of those four terms. So that will be our next step moving forward. Anything else on that, Joe? No, it's the high points. All right, so again, that's a yellow, but uh, now for our next one, trauma yeah. inform. So just to give you a, a quick history on trauma informed practices here in the district, a number of years ago, CV, CV was very, I think, visionary in starting that conversation about trauma. And, and its um, impact on, on students' learning and, and on their development. 
and we began a relationship with Forged and Fire and, and doing a number of trainings across the district for teachers. And what has happened between when we started that in CV and where we are today in the comprehensive plan is that uh, Pennsylvania State Department of Ed has also said that trauma is important to look at. And so what has come from that is they put together a plan, a, a proposed plan that each school district then has to put together. So that's why that is part of our comprehensive plan. The state is asking us to do it. We know this is important. We've been doing it for a number of years, but now we're going to put it into a really practical and very clear and transparent way of how we're going to be looking at trauma sensitivity and, and practices at CV. So this year, uh, Dr. Metzinger and I worked on this together. I want to make sure that she's included. Um, we began the year uh, looking at what the state put together. And they had gave a, a model trauma plan, which is about 70 pages long. And so when you look at something like that and you and you and you put it over top of what CV has already done, we had some overlap and we wanted to figure out what our steps are going to be. Um, so uh, Rachel and I, you know, sat down, we looked at all the all the components and what we want to end up with, and we put together a three-year plan on how we're going to get us to that final document to say this is CV's comprehensive trauma programming. Um, so what we did this year is we identified um, a, a need, which is to look at some data. So part of that data is we know we've done a lot of training in the district, but we want to know what that training has yielded. So we're going to be doing a, um, a Arctic survey study uh, by Arctic um, in August for the uh, during an end service and the teachers are going to be doing that so we'll find out where where our training has you know really improved some understanding where we have some maybe holes maybe things are stronger in the elementary and not as strong in the secondary or vice versa we're hoping that data shows us what kind of training we need to do in the future what are what are our next steps the other training that we want to look at is um, what do we need to do for our staff what do we need to in infuse into the classroom? So the set specialist was important to talk about for that. So that's that's the person that we talked about in K to five that does the social emotional trauma piece. Um, the other area that we're looking at is additional data um, in terms of the PACE survey that we do it for some of our some of our um, grade levels through CV, and we'll be looking at our safety data. Uh, we'll be looking at securely information, and we'll be getting an idea about what that data shows us and what our next steps are going to be. So that's, we've, we've met our year one deliverable, and year two is going to be a lot of data analysis and planning with some community service agencies to figure out what we need to do next. We're getting there. The last priority is priority for uh, community engagement. Um, I think that the priority actually reads something like to identify things that are mutually beneficial. Um, and so when you think about mutually beneficial, you know, we're in the business of preparing students for the <coughs> future, right? Life after CV, whatever that is. I mean, and we want to make sure that they have all the tools and resources available to be successful for whatever that is. And in doing this, um, we've had a history at CV where we've worked with community partners um, and at various levels of success and at various levels of engagement. And so this priority area is focusing on the notion of making those connections and really cementing them, um, really looking at how do we keep these connections going. Uh, one of the things that we've learned over the years is that this is one of those areas, as soon as you stop thinking about it, it dissolves because we're busy and businesses are busy. Busy, You know, like with the companies that are looking to work with us, everyone's willing, but, but they get tied up in their own work. So this is an area that, that is high priority, extremely important, um, and because it, it's looking at how do we better support our local community in preparing our learners for their future, for their tomorrow. And so there's a number of things, you know, this year that we did in looking at um, our current practices. We, um, and Mel Upton is the, is the key driver behind all of this in her position of looking at non-traditional learning. But some of the things that we did this year was we were, met with the chamber at various times. We, we uh, worked with Career Link, Lancaster, and understanding the different things that they had. Um, they had started putting things in place a couple years ago, and then the pandemic hit. And that stuff kind of, again, went dormant. So they're looking at re bringing, uh, reintroducing some of the work that they had already started. Inspire is a program 
um, as an example of that. And Inspire is, is intended to connect the classrooms to business. And so like local businesses would put their information in, in the program called Inspire and teachers, regardless of their content area, could look at, well, how can I make a connection to um, you know, this, this company or, or you know, the, 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 always the question my students ask, why do I need to learn this? And so where is algebra in the quote unquote real world? <laughs> you know, and, and, and why it's important to learn that. So that the, the Chamber and, and um, ClearLink are, are reintroducing a program called Inspire. Um, and that's, again, a work in progress. But as an example of working on those, those community partnerships and ways to connect the classroom to the uh, quote unquote again real world. Today we had, Mel had put together a breakfast where we invited local um, community partners um, to come and, and just kind of really just meet and greet. And she had a nice little program put together where she outlined our thoughts as a school district our, our, and our thoughts going forward and invited them to consider partnering with us. Uh, and there's a variety of ways they can partner. They can partner through perhaps hosting internships or externships, if that's something they're interested in. They can partner with us in looking at perhaps job shadowing, like day experiences, if they can uh, accommodate that. They can partner with us, for example, in looking at industry tours. You know, as when you approve the calendar, you remember the high school we built in November 21st as an industry tour day, where we're taking the high school staff out to various industries locally to look at what the expectations are. You know, what, what does today's worker really need? What, what are those skills? Again, thinking about that profile, thinking about the work that teachers do in the classroom, how do we make those connections? So there's another example of how different businesses can partner with us. Because not everyone can't do it all. And some businesses may be more um, in a position to do the industry <coughs> tours, but can't take on internships just because of the nature of their work. So, um, so today was a, a, a nice kickoff to that, and Mel um, is collecting that information, and that will help guide our work going into year two. Okay, you did two slides at once. Mark, you were there this morning, and mm -hmm. it really was inviting the input from the, the community yeah. the businesses to say, yeah, how can you be a partner? I felt like the response was good, and I got to talk to some of the business centers, and a lot of them are really excited about connecting with CV, in particular in regards to just being able to give our students <coughs> options. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm excited to get into it a little bit deeper. Yeah. And Mel did a great job. Yeah, she, okay. she does a fantastic job with that stuff. All right. So year one reflections. When you think about the, the strengths and the challenges of this year, you know, one of the strengths was that the core teams met regularly to share progress. Um, and now uh, attribute to that to Jill is a program that she had worked with at York that helped guide that process. Because when you put in, when you create a comprehensive plan, that was a lot of work in and of itself, it's just creating it. But then to bring it to life is a whole other thing. And so um, the framework that Jill had shared with us helped us make those monthly meetings happen, help you know, kept us accountable. As, as team leaders and say, all right, you, <laughs> I have to say, here's what I did with my team. Um, and so it kept that in front of us. So that was a, a nice piece. So when you look at those, those core team meetings. As far as faculty um, spotlights, you know, again, the importance, in my opinion, of, and I think of others, of this comprehensive plan is that it's a living and breathing document and work. And so sharing with the faculty throughout the year different highlights. For example, I shared with you, like in March, when we did the instructional model, you know, putting the actual document in their hands and saying, here's the instructional model. Here's the PowerPoint that we, we uh, created to help guide the principals when they were talking to their staff and the talking points that go along with each of these slides. And then I mentioned about the, the priority piece that the staff did back to us. So again, another part of that reflection was keeping it in front of the staff, keeping the staff engaged, saying, you know, this is a serious thing. 
and that we are going to take this seriously and keep taking these steps forward. Um, in looking at the, uh, the communication and collaboration between different groups, you know, Jill mentioned about the example of sharing that data between the work that like, the instructional model was doing, as well as the, um, the other uh, committee over here on the other side, so sharing that, um, using common language. Um, so a lot of good stuff out of this first year, but there's always room to improve. And so, year two. Yeah, so the way we approached those action teams was we had a cabinet member paired up with either a principal or an assistant principal. So there was always a district leader and a school leader who were kind of co-leading that action team. And we brought that team together, I think, two days after the teachers left, and, and we spent time digging into, all right, what worked this year? What didn't work? And so our team came up with some revisions to the process that we think can really um, make this go even more smoothly and more effectively and efficiently for next year. One of them is the more intentional overlap of the action items and the tasks. So you saw a lot of kind of individual check marks and these are the deliverables. Our team said we often found each other, found ourselves cross-teaming on those individual priorities more often than not. And so we put a new structure in place next year where we're actually going to meet as a priority area. So for example, priority three. We have three action teams. We had the equity piece, the growth and achievement, and the trauma. And we said instead of three different action team meetings happening every month, let's bring that whole priority group together, spend more time at the table together, but overlap and intentionally look for those areas where we can work more um, cohesively and collaboratively. The other piece is increasing communication. So that core team, that district leader and that school leader, we really knew what was happening with this plan. I mean, like Don said, we met every month and it was detailed. You were on task or you were off task and you did not want to show up to that meeting with all off tasks on your section of the, the work plan. Trust me, you do not want to do that. Um, but then what happened was that team kind of became the keepers of the plan. And we reflected and said, hey, we need to make sure all of our administrators are, are know what's happening or at that information level almost as deeply as that core team. And so that's a process we, we build in um, a restructure to our monthly meeting that Dr. Z convenes with all of the administrators to enhance that communication and make sure all the administrative team members really do understand the action steps that are happening every month. And then that last piece was the team all agreed that um, Having those deliverables outlined this clearly was really helpful for them in communicating with staff because our teachers then made connections to their goals and their professional learning. Um, but we didn't get we didn't really get to that until September because this was a new plan and we were figuring it out. So this year uh, we want to have those year two deliverables ready for kickoff in August. We start with those deliverables. We get those priorities out in front of the staff so that if they choose to connect into those comprehensive plan focus areas, um, they have that information right from the very first days of the school year. So those were some of the, the high level reflections that the team put together in moving forward the process for year two. I know this seems like a lot, and Mike, you said it, in fact, when I first started here about making your goals measurable, and, and this is, these are measurable goals, and we're holding each other accountable for hitting those goals or not hitting the goals, and action plans to move forward. Um, I will tell you that in, in all my years of education, I've never had a comprehensive plan that actually worked. They just don't, we didn't use them. We, we sent them to the state and we never used them. This is a, a living, breathing document that administrators are involved with, teachers are involved with, community is involved with. So. As a board, you should be proud of the, the goals that you set that measure against the comprehensive plan, knowing that the teachers, the principals, the district office, everybody's moving in the same direction. Because we have the comprehensive plan and the goals, and now we have action steps, and like you said, Mike, mm -hmm. measurable steps. So again, kudos to the administrators and teachers and community members who made this happen. I, I would echo that about, they used to be called strategic plans. And we'd write them and put them on the shelf for three to five years. Mm -hmm. 
and then take them down and rewrite them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think it was a brave step when Dr. Mann brought us such a quality, you know, mm -hmm. comprehensive plan. And uh, I give the board credit for jumping on it and saying, we're going to make everything in this district focus on that plan. Because that plan was written by cabinet, administrators, <coughs> uh, teachers, parents, community members, business members, to tell CV what we ought to be doing. And that's, that's what we should be listening to. And we built everything on that. We trashed all of our other goal documents and started a new one. And I know some of this may have an abstract pedagogical sort of sound to it. But the end result of all of this is always the same, which is student achievement. And those of us at the top of the organizational chart like to talk about the buck stops here and how we're uh, accountable, which brings us both praise and criticism, not in equal amounts. But I think one of the, the best things we've done is, is come up with a district that knows what it wants to do and is working on how to do it. No matter where you look in this district, no matter what document you look at, you will see the same focus. And I can't help but believe that, that will always lead to a larger uh, percentage of our students being more and more uh, having higher and higher achievement, which is what it goes to. And I think the credit goes to those people on the ground that make this all work. I mean, we get to say we did this, which is really nice. But we have to remember who we have to recognize to get all this done. And I think those PVAS reports tell us that something about this is working right. This idea, if you have a good plan, you put all your eggs in that basket. And uh, that's what we did. That's what we did with our, our our health and safety plan that got us through COVID and allowed us to have these kind of PVAS scores. So um, focusing everything where it belongs and having everything coordinated uh, is something that, that I think this, this district can be really proud of. I just want to say a special thanks to all the people that continue to work on that stuff. Yeah. School's ended, and you're still talking about still meeting and going through all these things and all this reflection and review. It's just a lot of work. And I hope overall the, the climate is positive as we continue to work towards that. But just thank them for us as you meet, that we really appreciate them going above and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not like thanks the work is done. Well, it's going to mm -hmm. keep going and going and going and going and going. Thank you so much for this doing all of this right down in the last future. This is very impressive. I'm very proud. I'm very proud of you. Good. Thanks, guys. So I leave while I'm on top. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. That's a great one to leave on. <laughs> Next three are all yours. Hmm? Next three are all yours. I'm I, sorry. I, J, and K are all yours. Yeah. Um, our next item, uh, our compensation for uh, the Chief Financial and Operations Officer. This goes by contract mm -hmm. at the p-value that we approved. Mm -hmm. So if there's any questions, I'll entertain them. If not, I would take a uh, motion to approve item I. I move that we approve the compensation for Chief Financial Office uh, and Operations Officer for 2022-2023. Second. Mm -hmm. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Talley? Aye. Mrs. Kafka? Aye. Mr. Gensel? Aye. Mr. Hurst? Aye. Dr. Martin? Aye. Mr. Trowbridge? Aye. Mr. Bidet now? Aye. And Mrs. Croft? Aye. The same thing is true of the superintendent's report, our superintendent's compensation. It's based on contract <coughs> and that p-value. Uh, the evaluation is being completed. The results will be posted on the website <coughs> as per the law. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll entertain them. If not, I'd like a motion to approve item J. I move that we approve the compensation for superintendent for 2022-2023. Second. Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Kavka? Aye. Mr. Gensel? Aye. Mr. Hurst? Aye. Dr. Martin? Aye. Ms. Trowbridge? Aye. Mr. Benigno? Aye. Mr. Uh, Talley? Aye. And Mrs. Croft? Aye. The last item on this agenda is uh, the voting delegates for the PSBA Delegate Assembly. That's being held on Saturday. Um, 
they will have a small, relatively small group uh, at Mechanicsburg. The rest will be um, through Zoom. Um, what will make it a little more interesting this year is they will be reviewing the, the new uh, platform the PSBA will use for its legislative work. So if you're interested in legislative stuff, if nothing else, it might be interested in listening to. Being a second class uh, uh, school district, we get three people uh, that attend. Uh, if you can't, nobody makes a big deal of it. A lot of this is my intention is to attend on that Saturday. Uh, if we don't have three and, or somebody can't make it and someone else wants to go on, uh, within probably that last month, we can change that. So are there any people interested in attending this? You can start with me. And I would like to try to get up to Mechanicsburg if possible. Do you want to explain what second class means? It's by population. Case we didn't Once you get we over, what, 30,000, you mm -hmm. become a second class. Is this it's restricted by population. Yeah. yeah. Is this when you're saying the majority of it was reading like policy and stuff, but then they're also doing the legislative piece? Uh, every year the delegate assembly has to approve any uh, policy, well not policy changes, bylaw changes. Uh, they use this also to give uh, the financial report, election results, you know, some of it a lot of people aren't really paying that much attention to. But it's always interesting um, if there are people there that want to change the focus of what PSBA's platform should have and where their focus should be. They usually pick uh, three or four uh, primary topics. And uh, that, that can be interesting. It can also be boring. I mean, it's, or <laughs> it's organizational, let's face it. But and you said they also do it by Zoom? Mm -hmm. okay. You can mark me down as, in, as interested. Okay. Particularly the legislative piece, I'd be interested in that. Okay. So, yeah, I would attend the whole thing to get to that. That's fine. Okay. And I, anyone else? I would be interested. Okay. That, that, that's three. And if anyone else is interested later, uh, it, it's uh, Mrs. Trowbridge, myself, and Mr. Yes. Gensel. And Mr. Gensel. Uh, would someone give us a motion to appoint these three? Make a motion to appoint Mr. Genzel, Mrs. Groff, and Mrs. Trowbridge to whatever it is. So. <laughs> Delegate, assembly. Delegate assembly. There it is. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any no is your, uh, or abstentions? You thought I was going to have another roll call vote, didn't you? <laughs> that doesn't require it. Uh, information agenda. Are there any uh, issues anyone has with the finance and operations report? Any comments or questions on the instruction, curriculum and instruction report? <coughs> Dr. Zig, is there anything to be heard from federal funds? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, committee reports. Uh, PSBA, uh, the report is posted. Um, I have no idea what they're talking about, about new sections in their elections. Hopefully by the time they're done nominating people, we'll find out what they're talking about. Um, and and that, that will come up over the summer and early fall. Uh, the one thing I wanted to add was they're doing an advocacy uh, initiative right now. Every week they're focusing on one specific issue. The first week it's um, mental health. This is part of the, the budget where they're trying to get money put from the budget. The second week, it's special ed. And the third week, it's career and technology investment. So that's, that's what they're down to. I mean, the big issues are just getting us more funds and more fair funds is always there. But these are their focus areas. Um, I don't think there's anything else except for what's listed on it. Had I, I can't remember between here and the IU. I sometimes don't remember which I announced to, uh, that the state is coming up with recommended um, online courses. PDE decided they should have recommended online courses. <laughs> yeah, something you always have to worry about. Uh, CTC, is there anything from the CTC? Uh, not this time. Um, CVEF. <laughs> yes, I met with, we met here as a group on Friday. Um, Dave was here and it was my first one I actually got to go to and talk about a great group of people. To listen. So even the few minutes I was here, just how they all interact together and how they work together collaboratively as a team, I was highly impressed. And they all seem to have a good heart and have great intentions in what they're doing. Yeah. 
and really look out for our district and stuff. And they talk much about uh, what their finances would be going forward. Are they doing well. Yeah, they, yeah, they had, they're talking. Yeah, they talk about having a golf outing and yeah. um, a couple other things. I kind of just wanted to take in the information this yeah. time and get acclimated to it. So. Yeah. yeah, Derby Days is a big one from Clark. <laughs> Excuse me? Derby Days. Oh, that's right, the Derby Days. I forgot about that. It balances uh, yeah. right now just over a million dollars. Wow. Uh, education Foundation. I'm sorry? I was talking to Kathy. She wanted to know what it was. Uh, oh, can I say about Education Foundation? They we provide funds. Thank you. They, yeah, it's not on there. It's <laughs> yeah. They, 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 we usually get a regular report, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, they provide funds. Uh, by application right. mm -hmm. for teachers in classrooms and projects that aren't in our budget. Didn't I just read that in the penny saver? I think probably. You may probably. Have to get grants. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. grants They're local yeah. business yeah. owners on those. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and previous uh, CB <laughs> yep. employees. Yeah, previous, yeah, our previous superintendent Jerry is. Yeah. And, and some of the teachers, teachers are teachers. there and yeah, some test board members. Yes. Yeah, never board members. It's, it's a great group. They uh, and past graduates too. Some of those want to graduate. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Construction team update. We have two of you here. And Fred as well. Would you like to join us. <laughs> so I'll start off with uh, well the the, the middle okay. school. Um, bulk of the work right now and the focus is on finishes. So paint, uh, casework, uh, this, this picture depicts uh, most of that right now. Um, paint, casework, uh, ceiling grid, ceilings, lighting in the ceilings, uh, then flooring following after. Um, the, the, the direction is basically the, the three-story classroom addition, uh, it's second Floor, ground floor, then first floor is how that's going to follow through. Then into the administration area uh, for finishes, uh, doors and hardware will, will be included, uh, and move into the servery. So, so the goal is to um, is to have those areas: the classroom, the administration, and the servery um, able to be moved into to start moving furniture and, and getting the classroom set up with the cafeteria and the, and the gymnasium following after. Um, there are difficulties. Uh, labor is probably the biggest one right now. Um, everybody's in their summer crunch. A lot of these contractors are doing schools, and um, it's, it's really tough to be pulling labor uh, back and forth. We have uh, specifically mechanically right now, the mechanical contractor is struggling with labor. Um, So these are showing uh, some of the, uh, again, the painting. That's the that's that's the the chillers on the roof. And again, the classrooms. Exterior is moving along. Uh, we uh, for 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 turn for temporary occupancy is what we're shooting for. Uh, um, all blacktop will be down in basically the base coat, probably not the finished coat, but walks, curbs, that'll all be installed. Uh, all those egress areas have to be available. Any questions? Got really quiet. Yeah. It's when we went in, uh, the three of us, was that Thursday? Yeah. It's nice to see cabinets and sinks and toilets and everything kind of like starting to move along. So it's nice to see. Yeah, a big issue will, is, is also a system in the HVAC system and getting, getting uh, more and continued ventilation in there, uh, pushing hard to, to, by the end of the month, to have those up and running is what, they're, is what we're pushing for. But, and also eliminating dust. Getting the dusty environment down. Yeah. Nice status. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> Anything from the committee? Um, well, you have any questions or anything? But 
Moving along. We toured it, yeah. Moving along, fingers crossed. <laughs> Starting to start to like to be rumors pretty soon. Yeah. Any any questions for the construction team? This, if not, this is the next time in the agenda where um, people may address the board on any issue. Does anyone would like to address the board? <coughs> Are there any board comments or announcements? Yes, uh, Mr. Scrub. Uh, I have a question um, in regards to uh, policy 123, the sports activity. Um, me and Mr. Talley have been talking about looking into the language for that. You're going to make me dizzy. I'm sorry. Looking into the <laughs> language for that based on what has transpired at Hempfield. Uh, maybe a policy review of that policy may need to come. Okay. And, yeah, and then Mr. Talley yeah, so, will talk a little more about yeah. that. So when you take a look at, at policy 123, we reviewed it at 23 years ago, and it comes with... Um, um, Intergalactic athletics is, is is what it's called, um, and it just as an FYI, um, I think we we should we're going to with Mrs. Groff's permission, we would like to bring it up earlier uh, to take a look at it as as a board. It really is to it's kind of it's to follow through with Hempfield just approved their policy in terms of uh, transgender in sports was one aspect of it, and I think that was probably the big elephant in the room. If you take a look at our policy, because whenever something a request happens, we always refer back to policy. It's just standard, etc. If we have a situation and we refer to policy, we have so many holes in it that uh, it would be, uh, yes, it would sink pretty, pretty quick. So what we want to do is we want to bring it up earlier for the review, um, get ahead of the curve, etc. with that. Um, and uh, and, and have a discussion and a review of it. Um, as I told these gentlemen, that when I'm asked to add something to the agenda, my intention usually is to uh, grant that. And that's just a topic that isn't something that, that's uh, a current issue for us. In that case, what I do is I ask the board, are you interested in discussing this? And if you say you are, we put it on the agenda. If you say you're not, then they're the only two people that care. So how do you feel about uh, bringing this up for review? I, I like the thing of being proactive. Mm -hmm. yeah, I see a lot of heads bobbing. Yeah. Yes, okay. um, my so only concern good. right now, I mean, I think it's a good idea to talk about it, but I noticed that Title IX is supposed to be coming out with its guidelines. This month is almost over. I don't know if they'll make it, but hopefully next month. So maybe if we're lucky, by the time we start talking about this, we will have the law because... Uh, we can discuss this all we want. The bottom line is, whatever the law says, we do. If we agree with it or not, that's what we have to do. So I'd like to have those laws in place, but that doesn't mean we can't discuss where our concerns are. So if it's okay, we will put it on next month's agenda. We only have one in July. Yes, okay. Yeah. One in July, yes. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not sure if you want. Would the athletic director do that? Would you do that? Or would who would, who would be in charge of the... Re or do you well, want to we'll throw it out do, there as is? I, I, again, um, since this is not a first reading, yeah, <coughs> it's just a discussion. It's a discussion. discussion. All right. And then, so what um, we can do is, is take a look at neighboring districts and also the PSBA recommended to see okay. what they okay. have to add to the discussion. And I guess it's yeah. in the front. Yeah, we're, not, we're, we're not making an action no, item. Yeah, no no front yeah. yet. We'll make it, yes. I think it's pretty obvious. If we would like to discuss on a more general yep. basis Correct. before yeah. we get down to actually writing, what, works. It, before yeah. writing what gets involved in it. Correct. Okay. That's okay. fine. Okay. Yeah. Direction, thoughts. Absolutely. Wording, all that no, that's Absolutely. good. Perfect. Thank you. Thank I, you. I, I think that's better than having somebody write it and then bring it to us and say that's not what we wanted to do. No, I prefer we negotiate as a board. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, President. Mrs. President. Your dates are on there. I have one announcement to make before we're done. I'd like us all to uh, take a moment to thank our uh, board secretary, Mrs. Martin, who is leaving us. As angry as that makes me, we wish her well. I want to thank her for all the help she's been in this last couple of years. She's done an excellent job whenever the board needed something. She just knew where it was and how to get to it. So thank you, and we will miss you. did confirm with next week PSB will be there. Oh, okay. For the board. 
Retreat. Oh, that's good. Um, with that said, uh, I would now take a motion to adjourn to executive session for legal and personnel reasons. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. aye.